For liquid samples in transmission spectroscopy, we use various transmission cells. I'm going to show you one example. There are many different kinds, including permanently assembled ones, where they just have fill ports, you fill them, you never worry about the spacer, it's been set at the factory. You can get ones that have screws rather than this type of assembly to hold the cell together, which allows you to generate higher pressure in sealing it, which is both good and bad because it can cause cracking of the windows. Uh, and then there are various designs where you have adjustable or variable path lengths in the cells. The overall idea is to get the cell assembled with the two windows trapping a gasket in between, which I'll come to in a moment, a spacer that sets uh, the critical variable. So the first part here is the base plate, the base portion of it. I'm going to take and insert in there a Teflon spacer. The orientation of this one is not important. It's just there so that the bottom window is not sitting against metal, it's sitting against Teflon. Then I'm going to take my first window and drop it in there. So now that first window is in place, that window is a solid window, so the actual orientation of it doesn't matter. The next step is the critical, and the first of the critical steps, and this is the insertion of the spacer. You can buy these cells with variable spacers. For instance, here I have a 25 micron, 0 0.025 millimeter, 25 micron spacer, a 500 micron spacer, here's another 25, and a 15 micron spacer. The one that I'm going to be using is a 15 because the liquid I'm going to use, methanol, has a very high absorptivity, so I want a short path length. So that's why I'm going to use the, the thin spacer. And I'm just going to pick it up. I'm going to use this piece of tubing because it's just a good, easy way to pick it up. You can see the spacer. I'm going to lay it down in there. Now, eventually, the orientation of the cell is controlled by this pin on the outside of the outer um, the outer portion here, out of this portion with the, the connectors for the syringe on it. And that's going to fix the orientation this way. That spacer, if you notice, was kind of oblong shaped, so I just want to make sure that it generally orients across the cell and not the short axis. Now I'm going to use this piece of tubing that I've been fiddling with here. I'm going to pass it through the two fill ports of the cell until it comes out the other side. And you'll see that this is a very convenient way to assemble the thing in its various parts. The next part that's going to go on is the Teflon spacer at the top, which is used to make the seal with the top window. So passing through that and laying it down. And you see now that, that uh, those two pieces of tubing are helping me keep that oriented. And then finally I'm going to place on top of it my upper window sliding it through the two small holes, okay, into the first hole, into the second hole, and there's the overall part, and it's being held in the right orientation. I'm going to rotate this just back for my convenience as I bring it in, shorten those two pieces of tubing up, and then when I invert the whole assembly and lay it down, that piece of tubing keeps everything in alignment. Then I can pull the tubing out, it served its purpose, everything is lined up, then to finish the sealing of the cell, I'm going to drop in that aluminum ring, drop on my sealing ring. Again, as I said, there's different ways for this to work. There's some very simple ones. This is about the simplest one you can get. It's just a simple push assembly where you push the two windows together like that. Very low pressure. But for this one, I'm going to be using it. I screw it and then I screw it down. Now, if you over tighten, you can crush the windows, so I don't want to do that. I'm just going to tighten it finger tight, don't use a wrench or anything on it, and now the cell is ready to fill. I'm going to move these pieces over here and pull this tray in because I'm going to be dealing with liquids now, so I want the tray just to keep the liquids together. I've got my liquid here in a syringe which has a lure lock tip on it. The lure lock will lock to those mountings there, those adapters there on the cell. I'm going to do that by inverting the cell simply because this is methanol and therefore it's, it has a high vapor pressure and it would go squirting off. So if I do it that way, I've got it together and then I can invert the whole thing as a unit like that and bring it down. 
Now, this liquid has a very low viscosity. It's actually starting to fill the cell already just from the, the heat of my hands causing the methanol to, to volatilize. If you have a high viscosity liquid, you could put a second syringe on the other side and push down on one side while pulling on the other. Some uh, authorities also recommend pulling the liquid into the cell. In this case, since it's methanol, I'm going to be able to just inject it. I'm just going to gently push down on it. I can see it. As it goes in, you can see a liquid layer just shoot across between those two windows, and now it should start rising up through the other fill port. As it does that, I know the cell is now filled. So I'm going to remove the syringe. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to put on one of the two sealing taps. I will fill, I will remove the port. As I do, I'm going to get a little squirt of methanol, and that's going to generate just a droplet that comes out. So now I've got the cell filled. The methanol is in there. The little squirt is still on the window just a little bit, but uh, the cell is now ready for me to use. Oh, well, I'll put on the other ceiling. And now the cell is ready to take over to the lab and use in that uh, spectrometer where we'll run the sample. So the important things when you're filling this cell, first of all, the choice of window materials. The windows are made out of potassium bromide, sodium chloride, calcium fluoride, um, and zinc selenide. Um, if you're using a aqueous solvent, you don't want to use sodium chloride or potassium bromide. They will dissolve. Um, it's great to use calcium fluoride or magnesium fluoride. Either one work real well for water. They will, be, they will hold up well. Zinc selenide works even better, but cuts off your low-end spectral range somewhat. The other thing is the choice of spacers. If you're dealing with a liquid where you're looking at the neat fluid, as we are here, we're looking at neat methanol, in that case I'm using a very thin spacer because my concentration is going to be very high. In another case, such as biodiesel, where you're looking at the low concentration constituents of biodiesel, in that case you may want a very thick cell because the diesel fuel peaks come in the low end of the spectral range, but there's a range right where the ester peak shows up at 1750 wave numbers, and that ester peak stands alone. So even if you have a, a very highly concentrated amount of diesel, but you only have a little bit of the fatty acid methyl ester, you see a very clean peak that way. So the choice of the spacers matters for that. So the material, the spacer, and the fill method. And then whether or not you have a bolt-down cell or whether you have one that pulls apart, or one that has adjustable path length is all a matter of just what your application is and how you're going to work. But in general, that's how you fill it. So now we're going to take this cell over to the lab and do some transmission spectroscopy on a liquid sample.